Good morning. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Savitha Subramanian, uh, who's speaking today about uh, PCSK9 inhibitors and lipid management. Uh, We've known Savitha a long time. Uh, we both worked together with Alan Chait for many years. Uh, Savitha is a native Amer of Maryland and went to medical school in Chennai at Stanley Medical College. Uh, came to the United States to do her residency at University of Illinois and then did uh, endocrinology fellowship in St. Louis at Washington University and then did a, another remedial year here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Endocrine <laughs> fellow. Um, uh, Savitha has lectured uh, widely on the topics of uh, diabetes management and lipid management um, and is actually the physician lead in the UW, for UW Medicine in the CMO's office for diabetes population health has done some terrific work with the clinics uh, in the ambulatory care settings and in the hospitals and trying to improve uh, diabetes management in our system. And importantly for this topic, uh, Savitha is also on the Endocrine Society's Lipid Management Guideline Task Force. So I can't think of a more qualified person to give this important talk. Thank you very much Kevin for that lovely introduction um, and uh, thank you to Greg for inviting me uh, to present on this topic. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here and I see many familiar faces in the audience uh, uh, who have come out to support me from the lipid <coughs> clinic. So thank you. These are, this is my disclosure sl slide. And I guess my other disclosure is I'm an endocrinologist. <laughs> so in the next 45 minutes or so, I will take you through the world of lipid biology, focusing on the molecule PCSK9. Um, we'll talk about the utility of using uh, PCSK9 inhibitors to lower LDL cholesterol. We'll try to identify the appropriate patients where these agents are beneficial. And I will try to help you navigate the murky waters to have patients get access to this expensive um, medication. So it's well known that LDL cholesterol is the main driver of atherosclerosis. Many, many studies, including Mendelian uh, randomization studies, prospective cohort studies, and um, randomized control trials have demonstrated a log linear association between the absolute exposure of LDL cholesterol and risk of ASCVD or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So the higher your LDL, the greater your chance of uh, uh, developing ASCVD. It has also been well established that lowering LDL decreases cardiovascular risk. And for every 38.6 milligram per deciliter reduction, that's one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, uh, ASCVD events are reduced after one year by 21%. So over the last three decades, treatment of cholesterol has come a long way with the advent of the first statin, lovastatin, in the late 80s. Several statins have come. One has come and gone, that's cerevastatin. Several guidelines have been created, the ATP1, 2, uh, ATP3 revised, and that was in two, last revision was in 2004. And in, in, the, in the last 30 years, what we've learned is that there's a broad benefit for therapy with statins in both primary as well as secondary cardiovascular prevention. Uh, it's also been shown that more intensive statin therapy is better than less intensive statin dosing. And lower may be better, uh, meaning the greater the reduction in LDL cholesterol levels, the greater the reduction on cardiovascular events. In 2013, the um, guideline world changed and the ACCAHA guidelines identified four um, groups that would benefit from blood cholesterol lowering using statins. And these, of these four groups, the three high-risk groups include the ones on top. So it's the ones, uh, patients who require secondary prevention for clinical ASCVD, individuals with diabetes over 40 years of age, and the individuals with very high LDL cholesterol over 190 milligrams per deciliter, where the, typically where the genetic hyperlipidemics fall. 
treatment uh, optimal benefit is uh, was identified for this high risk group to be with high intensity statins and with use of moderate intensity in individuals who are older or those who cannot tolerate this however this was 2013 and it's now five years later several more randomized control trials ha are out and more um, data is now available for use of other agents and uh, maybe it's not just statin therapy that we need so do we need any more ldl cholesterol reducing drugs uh, rct data seems to be pretty convincing that that statins work so let's uh, uh, talk about this patient mr dg this is in 2015 pre-guidelines and pre-development of the uh, drugs that i'm here to talk about um, this is a patient uh, a lovely 52 year old gentleman i share his care with dr Martian, uh, Marshall Corson. Uh, he has heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. At the age of 26, he actually presented with an acute myocardial infarction and he underwent a three vessel cabbage. Um, I have modified the details of this patient a little bit. Um, so he developed some atypical chest pain in 2015 and uh, he had to undergo a, um, um, a PCI to one vessel. He, his lipid lowering regimen includes rosuvastatin, azetamibe, colocevalam, a bile acid resin, and uh, uh, niacin. And so this is 2015. Um, he also along the way has developed type 2 diabetes for which he's being treated with metformin. He's gained some weight over the years and that uh, silhouette over there is quite typical of his body type right now. Um, he has thickened Achilles tendons which is characteristic of familial hypercholesterolemia and his current A1C is 7. And if you were asking, well I haven't shown you the lipids, here they are. Uh, his total cholesterol on this four drug regimen, which is typically what these genetic hypercholesterolemics, uh, we used to treat them with this combination um, of medications, two, three, four drugs. His LDL cholesterol um, hovers in the 120 to 130 range. And he has had a recurrent event after many years. So then this begs the question, um, you know, you know, does this man need a different kind of therapeutic approach? So there's uh, three groups of patients or patient populations with an unmet need for additional LDL lowering. So that includes the genetic hypercholesterolemics, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia like the gentleman I just presented, uh, individuals who have very high cardiovascular risk and those with statin intolerance or aversion. Uh, the genetic uh, disorders of FH or familial hypercholesterolemia, these are the individuals similar to the one I just presented, very high risk of early or premature cardiovascular disease due, uh, due to pr primarily because their untreated LDLs hover in the 200 to 400 milligrams range. And 79% of these individuals are typically not at goal. And by goal here, I mean their LDLs are not under 100. Those with very high risk include those with previous uh, cardiovascular disease uh, and also including type 2 diabetes, difficult to achieve their goals despite whatever therapy they're on, and uh, 20 to 59 percent of these individuals may not be where you might want them to be. And then those with statin intolerance or aversion, they, if they're not on any statin, they're almost never at goal, whatever that goal might be. So here, um, you know, I want to point out that all the therapeutic approaches as well as dietary approaches we use to lower LDL um, actually act by affecting the LDL receptor. And why is it that I'm talking about this? Because I'm, I'm going to uh, describe the cell biology and, uh, of uh, LDL and LDL receptor here, because this will segue into how PCSK9 and you know the topic that I'm here to talk about, uh, it'll uh, tie everything together. So you need to know how um, LDL and the LDL receptor work. So this is elegant cell physiology that was described by Brown and Goldstein in the early 1970s. 
the LDL particle here shown in uh, the sphere uh, attaches to the uh, LDL receptor on the cell surface. This is a prototype of the hepatocyte. And this whole, this complex is endocytosed and this vesicle gets into the cell. Uh, the uh, LDL cholesterol is broken down in the lysosome so the cell can utilize the cholesterol and any other things that may be in the lipoprotein including vitamins, etc. Um, and the LDL receptor re uh, uh, recycles back to the cell surface. To understand PCSK9, you need to know a little bit more about familial hypercholesterolemia, the inherited disorder the gentleman DG has. So in this condition, LDL receptors are high from birth. So because of this, there's lifelong exposure to LDL cholesterol levels, uh, to high cholesterol levels in general. And mutations typically occur in the LDL receptor or ApoB. So to look at that, so I just showed you, this is a different schematic here. So the LDL receptor is on the cell surface here. This is LDL, and this uh, squiggly thing is ApoB. So this ApoB interacts with the receptor. If there's a mutation in the LDL receptor, this attachment doesn't happen. All the LDL floats in the blood, and that's what happens in FH, familial hypercholesterolemia. The other rare, 90% uh, of mutations in FH are in the LDL receptor, missense mutations. Um, if you have a mutation in ApoB, that squiggly pink is not is gone now. It does it is not able to attach to the intact LDL receptor. This is ve very rare. Less than 10% of uh, FH is due to this, but this also results in high LDL levels in the blood. So FH um, is used to be thought to, to be one in 500 incidents, but it's actually one in 200 to 250 now. Uh, most families only have heterozygotes. Uh, there's a direct gene dosage effect. So if you have a homozygote, LDL cholesterol levels are higher. And um, uh, compound heterozygotes, two different mutations, they will have much higher LDL cholesterol levels. And untreated, the risk of cardiovascular disease is very high in men and in women. And just like the gentleman, DG, I showed you, who had his first myocardial infarction at 26, uh, it's directly re reflected uh, uh, based on the exposure. So here in these um, patients, if you start statin therapy early, this is the heterozygous FH, um, you can um, extend out their... Um, uh, uh, decrease their heart disease risk. If you start them with high intensity later in life, you don't quite uh, achieve the same reduction as you would if you start earlier. And this is uh, individuals without FH. And if you're a homozygote, you, you develop heart disease in your first or second decade, decade of life. <coughs> and typically, these individuals do not have a problem with their triglycerides. Okay, so now this will lead to the discovery of PCSK9. So in 2003, um, a, a family was reported uh, where an individual presented um, uh, with a, a myocardial infarction, um, a man <coughs> age 49 um, um, with total cholesterol of 441, LDL cholesterol of 356, um, died from an acute myocardial infarction. Um, the gentleman was genotyped. He did not have any um, mutations in LDL receptor or ApoB but he had an FH phenotype. So the group went looking and what they found was a mutation in the PCSK9 gene. So this was the first time this was described and this is year 2003. So what is PCSK9? So that is PCSK9 right there. Um, say it once and you can forget about it. Uh, Proprotein convertase subtilisin kexin type 9 or PCSK9. It was already known, it had just been discovered, also called NARC1. So what it does is, it's a secreted protease, comes from the liver primarily, the kidney and the intestine, uh, there may be some secretion, but it's primarily liver, it's rapidly turned over in the um, plasma, and it's primarily removed through the LDL receptor. I, I will describe the how this works in a little bit. So how this all evolved. Um, so once that, gen that uh, group from France reported that um, individual, other groups looked at their FH populations, and and a um, group from New York, Jan Breslow's group, looked at uh, um, individuals in their cohort with high uh, lip LDL cholesterol levels and found several different missense PCSK9 mutations. 
So these individuals have LDLs typically well above 220 uh, milligrams per deciliter. These are gain of function mutations, typically missense. So I should point out, uh, we now know that uh, PCSK9 mutations are still quite low uh, uh, um, in the FH, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia population, about 1% or less. So as a corollary, Helen Hobbs and um, Jonathan Cohen in uh, UT Southwestern <coughs> looked at their Dallas cohort uh, study where they looked at the other end of the spectrum. So they picked out all the individuals in their cohort with very low LDL cholesterol levels and they genotyped these individuals and found that there was uh, um, a, some folks in that cohort with a loss of function PCSK9 mutation. And these individuals had very low LDL cholesterol levels. So you can see here, um, you know, 50s, teens, 15, 14. So um, this, uh, so what this showed was that people can have naturally low LDLs and these individuals also had very low incidence of um, coronary heart disease and they are not associated with any other detectable abnormality. So they live long lives, increased lifespan, etc. So how does PCSK9 work? So I told you we knew that the LDL uh, 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 particle interacted with the receptor. So there's this now this new player called PCSK9. This is this little kidney bean-like molecule. What it does, so it's secreted by the liver, and what it does is some of it floats in the blood, some of it interacts with the LDL receptor. So the LDL receptor, so this PCSK9 goes and binds to the LDL receptor uh, lipoprotein particle um, complex, and this whole thing gets endocytosed into the cell. And so what happens when there's PCSK9 is that this whole, um, I told you that normally we thought that this LDL receptor recycles back to the cell surface. PCSK9 targets uh, the LDL receptor towards degradation in the lysosome. So there's not enough receptors to recycle back. And so if you have a lot of this, you have high LDL cholesterol levels. So to summarize, if you, uh, PCSK9 increases cellular uh, degradation uh, of the LDL receptor, there's increased LDL receptor number, uh, decreased uh, receptor numbers on the sur cell surface, and increase in plasma LDL cholesterol. And this is how PCSK9 emerged as a new therapeutic target for treatment of hypercholesterolemia and related cardiovascular disease. So uh, it's interesting, and this is one of the most fascinating examples of how translational medicine works. So in less than 15 years, um, since discovery of this molecule, we now have uh, therapeutics. So starting in 2003 on the left, where PCSK9 was discovered and gain of function mutations, and then um, loss of function mutations in mice. Um, um, mice were treated with monoclonal antibodies, and then um, monoclonal antibodies already available for uh, therapy. The first uh, uh, normal subject, phase one, was done here in 2009. 2010, FH patients were treated, and uh, the um, uh, marketing approval in 2015, and we already have um, outcome study in 2017. So several um, um, approaches have been directed for targeting this uh, uh, molecule. Um, ph pharmaceutical companies have jumped on this, so you could uh, um, inhibit it in several different ways. So you could bind a P plasma PCSK9 using uh, molecules, uh, small molecules called adnectins or monoclonal antibodies, which is what has um, um, reached the market now. Or you could target decreased synthesis using siRNA um, or antisense oligos. Monoclonal antibodies that are available now um, include alirocumab and avalocumab. Uh, this is marketed as praluent. This is marketed as repatha, available since July and August of 2015. So about three, a uh, little over three years now. Uh, Pfizer had a product, bocosizumab. This is a um, humanized monoclonal. These are human monoclonal antibodies. These two up here. Uh, bocosizumab is a um, humanized monoclonal antibody. It has 3% mouse homology. And so uh, this um, uh, Pfizer has ended this program <coughs> for a variety of reasons, which I will talk about as we go on. And uh, uh, when I um, gave a version of this talk for gr Medicine Grand Rounds two years ago, uh, there were actually four other products, um, um, monoclonal antibodies, which were developed by various companies. Uh, at least three of them um, have gone away. One, uh, I, I just looked this up and looks like uh, Eli Lilly still has this going, but I don't know anything about this. 
yet. So how do monoclonal antibodies work to inhibit PCSK9? So once the injection goes in the blood, uh, the monoclonal antibodies bind right away to PCSK9 that's already circulating. Um, the, the ratio is thousand, there's probably thousand antibodies to one PCSK9 molecule and that way it'll mop up everything that's al already made in the cell and secreted in the next several days. Um, and uh, so when you don't have PCSK9, um, you, have, you don't have that uh, LDL receptor degradation and so you have LDL receptors available to circulate back to the cell surface. So um, uh, let's talk about clinical efficacy and um, patient populations. How, can, how, are the, how do these agents work? Do they work? How efficacious are they? So this is a, 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 an example of uh, what happens to PCSK9 levels, LDL cholesterol levels once the antibody is injected. I'm using evolocumab as an example here. So here's where the injection goes in the blood. The blue line is the injection, the monoclonal antibody. As the levels go up, this green line is PCSK9. The levels drop acutely, almost uh, right away, and it stays down for about 14 days. Uh, and correspondingly, the red line is LDL cholesterol level, and it drops, and it stays down after one injection for about 14 to 21 days. So how do these work on LDL cholesterol levels? And so th this has been tested with uh, both the available antibody levels. So I'm showing you evolocumab here. Uh, this, uh, so the, the, the flat line uh, on top is the placebo injection and this is uh, uh, twice weekly dose, uh, twice a month. So every two week dosing and this is monthly dosing. Um, you can see here with uh, this particular dose for evolocumab it's 140 um, and this is uh, 420. I think um, yeah, the, you don't really need to see the writing but essentially what this uh, shows is that um, after injection the LDL cholesterol levels drop and the same thing with alirocumab which is uh, uh, here, uh, the purple line here is uh, the every two week dose of uh, um, 150 or maybe this 75. Uh, if uh, you give it much longer, there's some sawtoothing, and if it's a lower dose, there's sawtoothing, meaning the LDL goes back up. So how effective uh, um, are these? So, so this is the dose finding studies that they did. And so now with the available doses, you have uh, for alirocumab, um, it's 75 or 150 every two weeks. Um, Avalocumab is for, uh, 140 every two weeks or 420 every month. Uh, so this, uh, if you, uh, after injections, the LDL cholesterol levels uh, stay, uh, drop and they stay down with continued injections. So very potent agents. And what about if you give this agent with um, other drugs on board? So uh, this has also been looked at in various different studies now. Um, this is uh, 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 12 weeks and 52 weeks after injection of uh, uh, evolocumab um, on people with n uh, no therapy or with statins or combination of statin with azetamibe. So this is what zero here is whatever baseline they start at and wherever they start and whatever therapy they're on, you give them this monoclonal antibody, there is a 55 to 60 percent drop in LDL cholesterol. And this is for both the available uh, products on the market. So um, the monoclonal antibodies I talked to you about, uh, the question you might um, ask is, you know, is there a limit to LDL reduction? So yes, once the m antibody mops up all the uh, PCSK9, um, that's the um, um, there no additional LDL cholesterol lowering will occur. And the effect lasts is, um, um, depending upon the dose and uh, if it's a larger dose the longer the effect and um, if it's a monthly injection the volume is higher but uh, it, is, it does seem to be more potent. What about effect on other lipids? We've talked, we've uh, seen what happens to LDL cholesterol. Um, so this doesn't really project well because most of the other lipid data show, goes in um, supplement data in uh, all these uh, studies. So I had to um, pull it out from, <laughs> this is the best I could do. But all you need to know is that uh, this is, uh, again, using evolocumab. Um, these purple bars show you the drop. This is non-HDL, this is ApoB, uh, this is triglycerides. Um, this is LPA. So uh, what, what I, essentially what I'm showing you is that there's a good drop in non-HDL and ApoB. 
triglyceride lowering is less impressive, about 15%, which is actually, um, if you look at uh, statin data, statins can potentially lower your triglycerides uh, uh, a bit more, up to 20, 22%, depending on which study you look at. But the interesting thing, thing that comes out of this, these studies is that, is this the effect on this particle called lipoprotein little a. And there's a, in this particular study, there's a 25% reduction from baseline of LPA. So what's the big deal? So this is quite exciting. What is LPA? Uh, it's an atherogenic LDL-like particle, and the levels are uh, genetically determined. Um, the regulation and clearance of this particle is quite poorly understood. Um, and how uh, LPA lowering occurs w uh, uh, with this uh, agent is also not well understood, but essentially observational and genetic epide epidemiological uh, data provide uh, pretty compelling evidence that LPA is a causal, has a causal role in atherosclerosis. So there hasn't been any drug that has been able to reduce LPA levels, and this uh, surprising finding is quite exciting because of the uh, potential reduction in uh, cardiovascular risk independent of uh, well, somewhat independent of LDL. So it's not completely independent because LPA atta uh, attaches to the um, LDL cholesterol. So this is the uh, potential, this is the extra <coughs> benefit with PCSK9 inhibitors. So what is the population that benefits from these drugs? So currently these drugs are approved as an adjunct to diet and maximally tolerated statin therapy in individuals with heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, individuals who have known cardiovascular disease and who require additional LDL cholesterol lowering. And um, evolocumab is uh, also approved for individuals with homozygous FH. These are the individuals with uh, LDL cholesterols in 600, 700 range untreated. Um, Alarocumab doesn't have that added indication. Uh, so so I, I put this here, the statin-associated muscle symptoms. This is not an approved indication for these agents. Uh, however, if individuals with statin symptoms, uh, uh, myalgia symptoms, or SAMS, um, with any or who fulfill any of these criteria, um, would be um, an appropriate person to use these agents on. So, to quickly summarize what I've walked you through for this part of the talk, uh, so I've showed you um, um, somewhat that um, LDL. So I, I didn't show you all the data, but essentially uh, these um, inhibitor uh, uh, PCSK9 inhibitor antibodies have significant LDL cholesterol lowering efficacy in multiple different phenotypes. So, the people with genetic hypercholesterolemia. Studies have been done with, uh, with individuals without FH uh, as monotherapy, as combination therapy, and uh, what I did not show you is the data in the statin adverse patients um, where there was a benefit in LDL cholesterol low lowering. And then there's also an effect on LP little a. So now moving on to outcomes and safety. So here is a summary of all the cardiovascular outcomes trials. Um, I will walk you through evolocumab and alirocumab data in the next two slides. Uh, but I want to quickly highlight bocuzizumab. This is the humanized, uh, the uh, mouse mon uh, uh, monoclonal antibody um, uh, for a uh, program of uh, Pfizer, which is no longer um, um, being pursued uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, so th they did a, a couple of different studies, Spire 1 and Spire 2, where they took individuals who had LDLs at 70 to 99 on their LDL cholesterol or those with um, over 100. In the 70 to 99 group, bocuzizumab didn't show a, a positive benefit for cardiovascular outcomes in the short study that they did, but the benefit for LDL lowering and cardiovascular benefit was greater uh, for those who started off with LDLs over 100. However, these in, uh, the because of uh, these are uh, the humanized uh, antibodies, the risk is developing. Um, um, sensitization and um, autoantibodies to these agents. So the LDL cholesterol lowering effic efficacy dropped and because of uh, a lot of uh, injection site reactions, hypersensitivity, uh, this pr program has not moved forward. So let's look at the outcomes for avalocumab and alirocumab. So this study has been published. It came out in 2017, early in the New England Journal. Uh, a fun fact here is all the evolocumab studies, anything they've done, they have utilized names of French philosopher scientists. 
Fourier, Descartes, um, um, Gauss, uh, these are all French scientists. I don't know why, but it's a fun fact. Um, anyway, so what did Fourier do? Uh, uh, they randomized to 27,000 uh, plus people with known cardiovascular disease who are already on statin therapy to either evolocumab or placebo. And they followed these individuals for about two and a half years. It was about 2.2 years, about 26 months. Um, Evolocumab was effective in lowering the LDL cholesterol. It dropped the LDL from 92 to thir uh, 30, so 59% reduction going with everything else uh, that I showed you earlier, 60% reduction from wherever they start. And uh, um, the primary endpoint, um, um, they did, uh, so, uh, 9.8% of individual uh, um, uh, percentage on evolocumab reached the primary endpoint as opposed to 11.3 um, on the placebo. Uh, the absolute risk reduction was 1.5 um, and the composite endpoint um, uh, was decreased by about 20%. So that's what's shown here. Um, so this was a positive study. It did not show um, um, an improvement in mortality data uh, for the duration here. The curve seemed to um, 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 diverge. Uh, if they had extended it, maybe we would have seen a benefit, but, it, but the study was not extended. So that was... Um, 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 that was the result of this one. Uh, and there was no real safe uh, cognitive uh, 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 effects from lowering the LDL this, uh, to 30. Uh, seemed to be pretty safe. And the uh, uh, data on diabetes uh, was also published later in the year in December 2017. And there was no increased incidence of diabetes. Several other um, uh, outcomes have been looked at, peripheral artery disease, so some, some um, uh, mild improvements in certain other situations. But this was overall uh, has been considered to be a, a positive, a modestly positive study. Um, the Odyssey outcomes with alirocumab, on the other hand, has not been published yet. Uh, it was presented in a late-breaking uh, session by Dr. Philip Philippe Steg uh, at the ACC meeting. Um, in Florida, I did not go, but this data I got from so all this is avail the the slides are available on the Sanofi website. Uh, so this was an interesting tri trial design. It was uh, treat to target uh, individuals uh, who were either one to twelve months out from an acute coronary syndrome were randomized to get either alirocumab or placebo, and the dose was titrated. So they uh, started off at the lower dose, and then based on the response, uh, they were titrated to um, um, maybe the higher which is 150 um, and uh, the, these individuals uh, were targeted to achieve an LDL between 25 to 50. They didn't want anybody under 25. But there was an 8% um, uh, not dropout. Uh, uh, people had to be withdrawn because LDL levels were uh, dropped to under 15. Um, however, it seemed it was a benefit. Uh, the uh, the results seemed to show a positive uh, uh, outcome, so 9.5 in the Alaro versus 11, pretty similar to the Fourier study. And the, again, the benefits seemed to be greater in the individuals who uh, had a, a higher LDL. So the greater the lowering, the more the benefit. And there seems to also be a benefit from um, all-cause mortality, which did not, which was not shown in the Fourier. Um, again, uh, this data is not available. This is only a preliminary slide. So it's now um, seven months, and I'm not really sure wh what's holding up the the, uh, the uh, study uh, results, but it's not out yet. So, uh, but again, so we, uh, we will still wait for the actual publication. So based on what I've shown you, these agents seem to be safe. There are no specific serious uh, adverse side effects except, you know, bocazizumab, which had all the injection side reactions not uh, marketed anymore. Um, Sub-Q injections are pretty well tolerated for the two agents we have. And um, uh, like I said, injection side reactions, we have seen hardly any. Uh, these are all just uh, other things which, um, you know, go along. Uh, really, we don't see any of this. And uh, diabetes really has not been, an increased diabetes has not been uh, proven. And um, very low LDL cholesterol levels. So is that a concern? So uh, these agents are highly, highly potent. Uh, they can, in studies, uh, lower to as low as 18 uh, from what's published. And I just mentioned to you in the Odyssey outcomes, they had to pull out some people because they dropped to under 15. And this is what we see. Some people just drop their levels really low. I have had single-digit LDLs. 
um, when you drop that load, the Friedwald equation, which is still what the UW uses for ma calculating LDL cholesterol, is not accurate. Um, and uh, potential risks of a very low LDL, you know, mm, these are all hypothetical risks, increased hemorrhagic stroke, neurocognitive impairment, um, hemolytic anemia. I'm an endocrinologist. I have to throw in some hormonal abnormality, adrenal insufficiency, and vitamin deficiency. But, you know, Fourier um, uh, has shown that, you know, the lower the better for cardiovascular outcomes. And uh, also the Pfizer study showed that the, the ones who started a little bit higher on the LDL did get a significant benefit. Also, I want to point out, I did show you that there were loss of function mutations in PCSK9 that the Hobbs group studied. And these are individuals who live long, increased lifespan, no problems. Um, these are individuals with LDLs that float in the 10, 12, 15, 20 range. Similarly, the other condition um, that is reminiscent of loss of function PCSK9 is hypobeta lipoproteinemia, where they have uh, very low ApoB and LDL cholesterol levels. Increased lifespan um, is a big and no cardiovascular disease. So you could argue either way. Um, so there's no real evidence that uh, driving your LDL super low is bad, but would we really want to do it is a question that's still outstanding. So with that, I'll move on to the actual title, with the, the topic that I was actually supposed to highlight. Um, there's Dr. Oz gazing very benevolently at us. Um, and um, this was an article in uh, uh, the LA Times, um, uh, but what I want to point out here is what I'm going to tell you is that it's not super pretty. Um, the real world view of using PCSK9 inhibitors. Okay. So the big problem is access and cost. It's kind of like an expectation versus reality situation. We want our babies to eat like this, but the reality is that they actually eat like this. Very messy. Oh, I don't know, clean up on this is probably was not easy. That's my son from five years ago. It wasn't that bad. We hope for something that's not super messy, but I don't know that it is like that. It's a little bit of work. Part of the reason is this, the cost. And um, this is the cost this year for alirocumab, praluent. Um, the price was dropped a little bit um, a few uh, months ago. And alirocumab is at this rate. Um, in the UK, it's a third of our, about a third of our price in the US. And in India, the price I could find was 6100 This is about the cost in Mexico, Finland, and other places. Um, you know, this seems much cheaper compared to 15000 But in India, this is huge. This is like, I mean, it's expensive anywhere you go. Yeah, so that is my response to that. Um, so why is this? So the, 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 and the other tri um, issues with um, g getting these for your patients, because you know, I've showed you, these are very potent LDL cholesterol agents, lowering agents. They work, they're very pretty safe. Uh, cardiovascular benefit for uh, certain patients. Um, the coverage varies by insurance companies, whatever pharmacy benefit manager the insurance has uh, or works with, and the patient's plan. Another big barrier is access, access for Medicare patients. Okay, this can take multiple PAs and multiple attempts, multiple denied claims, and that is not a joke. That it, um, there was a study which looked at um, um, PCSK9 PAs, and almost a 97% first application uh, for PCSK9 in 2016 and 2017 was a rejection, outright rejection. Um, you um, can um, get it for your patient. And then the financial burden after approval is pretty uh, prohibitive for many uh, individuals, except, ex especially uh, retired individuals, people on fixed income, etc. And then there's always the argument of cost-benefit analysis. You know, is, is, are these really um, um, that um, beneficial, um, or are they going to be uh, cost-effective? So if you look at from the data, um, you know, the two-year number needed to treat um, uh, for these drugs, either one, alirocumab is about, or evolocumab, 66. Uh, if you take the wholesale acquisition price for this year, I'm averaging it at 14,000 a year. The cost to uh, prevent one major atherosclerotic event is about $1.8 million, okay? About the price of a house in Bellevue, maybe? <laughs> 
So, <laughs> so several uh, groups have looked at uh, cost-benefit analysis. And the analyses are a little bit uh, disparate depending on which you look at, but I've, I've, uh, um, I've referenced one over here. This is a good one because this was reviewed again, um, revised again last year. I haven't seen one for 2018. Um, it's bottom line is, however, all these analyses have shown that at current price, these drugs are not cost effective. Okay. So a study looked at from Dan Rader's group um, ju that just came out a couple of months ago showed that there, there are five different uh, barriers to access. Uh, you know, the, the, the reason which puts off providers, uh, clinicians from pre um, um, prescribing this is requirement to submit medical records. Um, you know, they, um, w when they want the records, they want data, like how long have, how many statins have they been on, what drugs have they, have they been on, all these different things that are act absolute requirements. You know, the, the drugs are restricted to specialty providers, cardiologists, endocrinologists, lipidologists. Um, and then um, insurance companies say you need to try multiple different drugs to get this medication. Um, and the requirement for genetic testing, which is not covered in the US and uh, will run the patient up to $2,000. There are some cheaper kits available now, but I don't know what the accuracy is. But what these authors said in that paper is that PA requirements for PCSK9 inhibitors are greater than for selected other drugs within the cardiometabolic disease area, raising concerns about whether payer policies to discourage inappropriate use may also be restricting access to these drugs in patients who really need them. So, um, I didn't come here to rain on the, on the parade. I'm going to try to tell you how we can approach this. So unfortunately, this is a, it's, it is a lot of work. So uh, in the last three years, this is what we've come up with, or this is what I've come up with for the patients that I see in our um, lipid clinic. You have to be really clear about documentation. Um, what is the indication? What is the individual's LDL cholesterol off therapy, on therapy? These may not be directly uh, available to you. You have to go chart digging. Do you have the time for this? Um, FH, uh, uh, in, if it's an individual with familial hypercholesterolemia, you need clear documentation of what their baseline untreated LDLs are. You know, if they have any clinical stigmata of FH, like tendons and thomas, um, you know, that's a surefire, um, you know, positive hit there. Uh, history of what statins they've been on. Um, if uh, you could use one of the um, uh, diagnostic criteria, uh, all these kind of increase your weight. Um, of uh, you know application and obtaining your dr the drug for your patient. Um, um, what kind of heart, uh, what cardiovascular disease do, ha do they have? Uh, CAD, uh, you know, put everything in there. You know, uh, how many times did they have a stent? Everything. What was their last cath report? All that stuff needs to go in there. Um, what have they been on? What is their maximum tolerated statin dose? And if they have myalgias, you know, do you have a CK level? All these things for documentation. And then there's the other end, which is the insurance end. Um, you know, it, it really depends on the patient's insurance plan and formulary. If you have a high deductible plan, if you have a plan which doesn't include these agents on the formulary, um, it's going to be a fight. Um, what is the preferred agents for the uh, um, agent for the insurance plan? Um, what are the PA forms? Make sure the forms are filled out accurately. One mistake, they'll send it back or they'll reject it. I can't tell you how in the beginning, uh, poor Louise, <laughs> sitting right here, has been through this. Uh, clinic notes with all these details. Uh, sometimes a peer-to-peer -peer call may be necessary. In earlier years, like meaning 2015, 16, um, we had to do several of these. I've had one rejection for a person with FH, which is just sad because you don't know who you're talking to. Um, um, it's just, uh, it, it can be, it can get really frustrating and ridiculous. Uh, there is a Medicare assistance program. There are copay cards um, available. Uh, but the big thing is, you know, you may eventually get them on this after all the hoops you jump through. And then the big thing is, you know, you may have somebody who's 64 or 63, they get their medication for two years and they go on Medicare. Uh, that's a big uh, hurdle again. So um, these are all the things you got to think of. So what are the tricks to getting approvals? So the most critical thing is identifying the right kind of patient. So I cannot emphasize this enough. 
you know, are you using this for the right reasons for the right kind of patient? And then once you do that, documentation of all, all that stuff, all those pointers, I, I, uh, points I told you in the previous slide, persistence and patience, we tell the patient right away, this is going to take two months sometimes. So that, uh, it was, that, that's what we, um, um, we tell them, about six weeks, eight weeks, so that you'll get a rejection letter, we'll keep working on it. Uh, so communicating with the patient is highly, highly essential. Um, and so we've kind of formed uh, what I would like to call a PCSK9 inhibitor clinic um, because uh, we uh, just about three months ago uh, we have uh, started a pilot pharmacy assisted program for this and it's worked out really well. Um, um, Mary Kelly, Mayumi Robbins, uh, Marianne Weber, these are some of the folks who are assisting us, uh, primarily uh, Mary and Mayumi, um, and Gina uh, Vigor, the pharmacy tech, um, but um, they can help us only if we have all these things. So otherwise it's just multiple back and forth. So. Um, this is piloting right now, uh, especially since this is a, a specialty pharmacy product. The way these drugs are shipped are they come in um, uh, they come in FedEx uh, packages every month with two injections, um, sometimes for three months, but typically for a month. Um, so uh, they um, they really need a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, for us, um, we are using uh, this this pilot has uh, uh, been helpful uh, with the pharmacy assistant. I will say our neighbors down south in Portland already have a PCSK9 inhibitor clinic uh, run by doctors uh, Shapiro and Fazio um, and uh, they have had excellent success uh, with such a program um, and uh, uh, have a very uh, according to their publication from last year they say they have a 97 percent success rate for getting their patients on PCSK9 but uh, it the crucial thing is uh, identifying the right kind of patient so very quickly, what's in the future uh, is a, um, possibly RNA interference. Um, I'll quickly talk about this, and this is just one slide, and, uh, and then we'll stop. Um, and what is this? Because this is in the pipeline, because phase three studies are ongoing. Um, this is a small interfering RNA. Uh, what this is, is um, here's the name of the drug, This good. This is a chemical product which goes and attaches to the cell surface uh, ASGPR receptor. It gets swallowed into the cell and this drug goes and attaches to this RNA inducing silencing complex. But bottom line, these are all fancy words. What it does is actually degrades the PCSK9 messenger RNA. Um, and so there's decreased PCSK9 synthesis. Uh, this, uh, it has potent uh, LDL reduction um, capability. Once uh, injection, this is a one injection dose, this is a two injection regimen, injected uh, in uh, uh, every three months. And it seems promising. There's a 45 to 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol, and it's a subcutaneous injection. Stay tuned. So, bottom line here is, uh, you know, who is the right person? What, when can you make a case for a PCSK9 inhibitor? So what I just told you, you know, if you need uh, ac uh, extra LDL uh, reduction, um, if you need LPA reduction, um, you know, if, you, um, if you've identified the right patient, they're well tolerated, um, knowing that the cost and prions are a huge ba barrier, if you thoughtfully select your patient uh, and you have a, there's a team approach and persistence, you can get your patients on these drugs. And uh, um, we, um, you know, as the pilot program um, progresses, um, I, um, you know, uh, right now it's, it is in pilot, um, it needs a lot of work as I showed you, so we're kind of limited in ma um, man or woman power, so um, I'm, uh, my suggestion to you is to, um, you know, if you have identified your patients, you can send them on um, to our clinic, we will prioritize these patients and see them for you and send them back and you can, um, you know, take them back literally, so um, this is what we foresee for the next six, eight, ten months or a year um, with um, these drugs until the cost comes down. 
so with that I will stop um, I want to highlight a couple of things here uh, Louise is in the audience uh, uh, she's uh, uh, she um, was a crusader for the last two and a half three years for the, our patients uh, now right now you know a, a lot of burden has been taken off of Louise but she did all of the early work uh, to actually figure out what actually is needed for these patients and our lovely pharmacy team uh, well, who is working with us to actually uh, help us get uh, patients and I also want to shout out to Dr. Doug Stewart I don't know if he's here but he um, uh, he's been a I don't know he probably doesn't know but he's been a, uh, a distant supporter of my work and uh, our clinic um, um, he keeps sending us his wonderful difficult patients <laughs> um, so but anyway um, that's all I have thank you very much uh, for listening and I'm happy to take questions We have time for just one or two very short questions and answers since we have to be out of here for a minute. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how about PCSK9 vaccine? Yes, so there. Uh, so question is about PCSK9 vaccine. Uh, yeah, I did put it on there. There uh, is one or maybe two companies working on that. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen any data. But there's actively, there's work going on on vaccines. Yep. And, and patients who are... Yes. Do they end up becoming PCSK9 averse also? Great question. Uh, are statin averse patients also averse to PCSK9? Absolutely. So uh, uh, be, yeah. uh, many are able to tolerate it, but uh, there are some who I've had patients who come back saying, oh, this stuff is bad. It gives me fatigue. I can't do anything. It wipes me out, which is true. It's an antibody. Um, so I've had uh, maybe three or four patients go off of the, off the drug. Absolutely. Yeah. Over there. Hi. So you seems like you have a nice setup. Right. Yeah. So it it's not just for FH. It is for uh, like I said, people with cardiovascular disease who you feel uh, you know if they have recurrent events and you've got them on whatever you feel is uh, um, um, you know uh, they should be on, but they're still having recurrent events. That would be a. Uh, person who would be an appropriate candidate for a PCSK9 inhibitor. So it's not just FH. Uh, it's also for your ASCVD patients who have progressive disease, you know, keep clogging up their stents or whatever, and uh, and you, they're on statins or they're taking it. So, um, yeah. Uh, but uh, that's why I, I highlighted, you know, you have to pick your patient appropriately. Um, you, uh, It's not for everybody. Uh, again, the cost is a huge, huge barrier for a lot of them. Uh, that's why the that that is also the reason why there's so much uh, um, barriers because the insurance companies don't want the floodgates opening for these agents. So, have you thought about like an e-consult system where people can plug in and you can sort of work the patient's shop and you know, you can provide your things they should be, but yeah. so, so be Yeah, so we have uh, e-consults for endocrinology. So if you feel like, uh, if your question is, does this person, uh, is it an appropriate uh, person for PCSK9 inhibitor, you can always send an e-consult. And if uh, and usually the lipid consults, I'll be the one doing them. Uh, and if I feel that they're an appropriate candidate, I'll say send them to the clinic. So, yeah. All right, well, thanks yeah. a lot.